this Bible verse that says, uh, For God to love the world that He gave us only His Son, because whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal everlasting life. And, and the important uh, or the thing that sort of uh, speaks out in this one is says, Whoever believes in Him, and that's it. You just need to believe. There's nothing, there's nothing more that we need to do. Here to worship uh, the King of Kings, the Lion of Judah, that's what the song talks about. Uh, it says every knee will bow down. Uh, not, not selective knees, not knees that God wants, but every knee will bow down.
song where it goes on to say, uh, the one who reigns forever, he is a friend. Uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think you can friend to this just like that. Jesus is my friend because I'm undeserving of being his friend. As soon as we sing the song, let's believe that Jesus is walking before us and beside us, within us. We have nothing to do. just need to get your communion things ready.
Only we're talking about why Jesus is our friend. It's just because he loves us. He loves us despite our inequities, our actions, despite of what we've done. Uh, just the thought that came to our mind this morning, uh, four or five in the morning. God doesn't ask us to make him harmful. He doesn't say, you know what, you walk 50 steps, I will walk 50 and then somewhere with me and I'll be a God and I'll be a friend. He's walked 99 steps already. He's waiting for you to take that one step. Right? And, and that one step is just to open your heart. There's nothing else that you need to do, nothing else that I need to do. Uh, and let him change your life. Uh, so that you live a life, you live a life of abundance, uh, fearless. The Bible says in Psalm 56, verse 3, it says, When I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you. God will never fail us to worship the living God. He bless the God of this world, He bless and bless others. And do not be afraid. God has already won the battle for us.
and uh, and even the issue underlying issue was sorted and just just thanking God that everything at every point like I had the frame of mind to call someone for help and, and he was able to come and help me and, and everything was taken care of so praise God for that and uh, also mum was just has been down this whole week and we were so worried that it was COVID because she works in school and cases have been rising but uh, we took a test uh, yesterday morning and it came back negative so just thank God for that as well <laughs> For the only father. And all our fathers. And all our children fathers as well. Them, guide them, comfort them, counsel them, 
shape them, mold them into all that you've created them to be. In Jesus' most precious name. Amen. And we have a little We have also a little bag like this for all of you. You can take it home to give it to your fathers or whoever a father figure in your life that you want to give them. So, Please move into communion. Yes. So the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And we just pray, Holy Spirit, that as we partake in this holy communion, that you will help us examine our hearts, that you will just enable us to come before you with clean hands and pure heart. And as we eat this bread and drink this wine, we really receive, Lord, your holiness, your righteousness, your cleansing, your healing, your forgiveness. We thank you, God, for your grace, for your mercy, for your love. Thank you for what you've done for us through Christ Jesus. In your most precious name.
wanted to share this uh, picture that I had when I was singing, which is like, you know, like who is God? And I was just thinking like one word and there was light, one word and there was like six days and like, you know, bam, 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 earth created. And he sees the same person, like sees this rad and, you know, uh, really the son or daughter who just squandered all his life and there's no like dignified like walking towards you know to embrace it's just like a running like you know like when you're so excited that you're just like oh my gosh I see you and like running and just like squeezing you in the tightest hug I just felt like that and I was like it it just blew my mind that the that, that God would just do things like this would choose to run toward us and squash us in a big time. So, I was actually very chilled through this week because this service was not being telecast. It was going to be the Bombay telecast service being telecast and then, anyway, this was suddenly telecast, so then whoa, butterflies in the stomach. But um, yeah, just Father, I just ask Holy Spirit that you will anoint my tongue and all the preparation, Lord. Just thank you for this message. Uh, and thank you for all that you want to do in each of our hearts, Lord, this morning. In your precious name, we. Pray. Amen. So since this is Father's Day, uh, I thought maybe uh, it's important to talk about the father, which is the first father uh, ever, So and talk about his love. Um, I actually asked uh, Rahel to do this song uh, before the sermon, uh, because my sermon is really based actually on the song. But I want to share with you a little bit about how I came to doing this sermon because really it was not what I started with at all. I was originally supposed to do the sermon that they perhaps may be doing in Bombay because he was doing a sermon and we were all going to kind of share the same thing across. And then Kripan who's doing a sermon in Bombay in Pune came up with uh, a story that he wanted to share about his own father and the story of the prodigal son. And so they said, you know, why don't you do something similar? And I said, okay, and I was just kind of really asking God, what is it that you want me to do? And then he laid on my heart this message. And this is a message actually that Uday did. And the interesting thing is that he did it in 2018. And it was not what he had planned to do that Sunday. He came and prepared to do something else. And Rahel was leading worship. She doesn't remember also. But she was leading worship that day. And she had chosen the songs all on the Father's theme. And the song, and the last song she chose before the sermon was Abba. And while the song, while she was actually singing the song and they were worshipping with the song, uh, Uday was struck by the lines of that song and he did a completely spontaneous sermon there and then on the father's love based on the story of the prodigal son. And I just felt, as I went back and listened to it, I thought, let me listen to it because God laid it on my heart. I, as I listened to it, I felt this is really what he wants us to hear today. So that's really what I'm doing thanks to Oh, then Rahel, it's so interesting that Rahel is here <laughs> today and I could ask her to do that song. Um, so, you know, we're all very, very familiar with the story of the prodigal son. Um, but the interesting thing is that what really gets missed in the story, because we focus a lot on the son and what the son did, but what gets missed in the story is actually it's the story about the prodigal father. And I don't know what we, how we think of the word prodigal because so far since it's associated with the son it's kind of like a waster or you know something negative. So I went back to the dictionary and these are the words that describe what, what prodigal means. One who spends or gives lavishly, foolishly, recklessly and waste is wastefully extravagant. Perfect picture of our father in heaven yeah, who gives us lavishly, extravagantly, recklessly even. We just did uh, communion 
And when we think about that love, that is completely reckless love, even foolish. It says that the cross is foolishness to those who believe. So this is really the story about the prodigal father and his prodigious love for us. So I'm just going to quickly ask somebody and uh, maybe Mahi, will you come here and just read this? Sorry, I know you have a headache. Uh, Luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Thanks. So we see here that it's really the story of two sons. One who landed up in the pigsty, right, completely in muck, completely messed up. And we see the other son who was with the father in the father's home, but embittered and unhappy and resentful, right? So we're going to see the story of these two sons and then we're going to see the father's heart, yeah. So in this story, after taking off the younger son, finally lands up in the pigsty and he realizes that the one place that he can actually go back to, that he knows he can go back to, is his father's home. And here's the amazing thing. So the son comes back broken, ashamed, guilt-ridden, full of self-condemnation, ready to be a servant in his father's home. right? But the father, who has been waiting and waiting for him, has a completely different idea. And the line I really want to focus on from the song that we just sang is, Your thoughts define me. Abba, your thoughts define me. And really the question for us today based on this story is whose thoughts define us? What defines us? Whose thoughts? Our thoughts? Other people's thoughts? Yeah? So just want us to just reflect on that as, as we 
as we uh, go through the story. See, for the two sons, it was the things that they did that defined them. Yeah, uh, and even though there's a complete contrast between the two sons, right? One is a good son, the other is a bad son. All the labels that we put on. One is a dutiful son, the other is rebellious. Is a rebellious one. Yeah, and yet both of them are wrong. Right? Both of them are wrong because of how they define themselves. They define themselves by what they did, right? Or how they saw themselves, or maybe even how the world saw them. Right, because it could very well have been that there would have been people commenting about oh that wayward son, oh this good son. And hello, how many times have we not all been <laughs> faced with those labels, right, from either the world, ourselves, or people around us? Yeah. So both of them were wrong because they were not looking at themselves in the way that the father saw them. Yeah. First, we see how the the younger son defined himself. Right, I am a sinner, he says, worthless. Fit only to be a servant. How many times have we said that to ourselves? When we think about that. Worthless, not good enough, not good enough to do what I'm called to do. Yeah, and that's how the, the younger son defines himself. So he's defined by his failure. He defines himself by his failure, by his sin, by his rebellion. But that is not what defines him in the father's eyes. In fact, there's they quite succinctly put it in his in his sermon the father has no time for this nonsense <laughs> i mean just see the picture here is the son i'm so sorry i did and he's making this whole confession and the father's almost you can even picture it he's not even listening to him he's saying calling so bring the robe bring the ring bring my son has come back he's not even listening to what the son is actually saying he doesn't even let him finish because his heart is just bursting with love and joy for the son. See, the thing is, he knows the son's heart. He already knows the son has repented. In that pigsty, he repented. He said, sorry, and I want to go back. Yeah, and that's the beauty of our father, yeah, that he already knew. So he didn't need the speech, because he knew the son. So he was just rejoicing at the fact that the son had turned away, repented, turned away from that life, and turned back to come to come back to the father. Yeah. And think about it. This is a son who in this wretched state, I mean, he is in a wretched state, but think about what he's done to the father. He's abandoned him, broken his heart, right? He's humiliated him because he's probably got, can you imagine what they were saying about this father? He's publicly going out there and ruining his life, right? So he's humiliated him. And yet, for the father, it was just enough that he turned around and came back. That's all he was waiting for. So, in the same way, you and I can go through life being defined by the mistakes we've made, by the wrong things we've done, by our sin. And I just want to say here, it's necessary. The boy had to recognize where he was. Right? He had to see where he was. So he had to repent. All of that we need to do. Those are necessary and good things for us to see, to be humble, right? But those don't define us. Those don't define who we are. Those are the things we have done wrong, for which, like the youngest son, we've repented, we've said sorry, we've received his forgiveness. Yeah. They don't define us. So in terms of the relationship for God, God wants to see ourselves and how he sees us is with a robe and a ring. Yeah, you think about the robe and the ring were actually marks of sonship. The ring, you know, the seal, my name. It's like sealing his God's, the father's name to the son. Right? So here's the son thinking I'm worthy to be a servant. And here's the father who says to the son and to us, you have my name. Yeah? You are my, I have clothed you with robes of righteousness. He kills the fatted calf, abundance, provision. He is here to celebrate who we are. He is celebrating who his son is. Yeah? He is not even thinking about all that he did wrong. Just <laughs> celebrating the joy and the wonder of who this son is. Right? And that's what he wants to do for us as well. So think about the song that we sang. You came running down my prodigal road. 
you came running with a ring in a rope and the picture of, I mean Melissa said that so beautifully he came running it's not even like the son had to go there and the father was waiting there even waiting with love in his eyes no he just left and came running this is the father foolish reckless love came running with a ring in a rope grace is the collision on our way back home to the arms of a father who won't let go so if you think about it if the son had come back and said i'm sorry and the father could have very well said yes you have sinned very lovingly you have sinned it's good you've learned your lesson okay come and be a servant or the father might have said come back and be my son i'm glad you've learned your lesson i think we're all familiar with that i think perhaps we've also done that a couple of times with people right who've made mistakes in our life who hurt us and all yes okay you know but we but right and the son would have been okay with that right when we've done wrong or we've hurt something somebody or whatever and we say we're sorry we're we're, we're okay we accept that maybe the things would not be okay with that person but not with the father yeah not at all with the father he instead gets extravagant outpouring of love and you think about that love yeah just visualize that love just pouring into the son's heart it cannot but have changed how he saw himself and saw himself today not as that worthless only fit to be a servant but saw himself again as the son precious beloved desired wanted and you and i are defined exactly the same way by how the father sees us if there's anything else any other line any other word any other lie please recognize it as a lie from the father of lies it is not from god it might be from people around you even those closest around you yeah maybe but it is not how the father sees us and today i really want us to be able to take that in that we are in fact there's another song that says i am who you say i am yeah we are who god says we are not who we say or how the world defines us so today being father's day i want to share a little story about my own father uh and i'm so glad my mom is here because she was very much part of that story um this is actually uh it gave me a glimpse really of the father's love when i look back on the story and i think i had an insight into what happened then uh just last night as i was writing this uh so it was 1989 i was about 24 and i'd gone through a couple of years of depression of anxiety of extreme fear and i think perhaps some of that had been triggered by the fact that my dad had a heart attack uh at about 53 which is 4 years younger than me at that point i didn't think about him and what was happening i he had been my rock he had been everything to me and i think i got destabilized when i saw him have the heart attack and him kind of suddenly be weak and be sick and be infirm and all of that and so i think i just went into this really rebellious phase i gave my mother particularly and my father a really hard time and my father and i clashed a lot through that time uh, to the point that our relationship really got broken and uh, so this was about 4 years and then i was in calcutta and i was going through a really bad depression and an aunt of mine came and was talking to me and i think maybe i shared something because she then called my parents and told them that you know what was happening with me and also that somewhere i felt that maybe my father didn't love me anymore you know so come 89 we're on, we're on holiday in my mom's hometown my father comes to me and it's remember it's fairly awkward my father comes to me and he says um, let's go on a walk so I say okay and we go and it is about the most awkward walk i have ever had then or even now because you know my father good malayali not used to, to sharing feelings and all of those kind of things right but he just kind of he, as we walk we kind of some small talk and he said you know i love you no and, and i'm always there I said yeah yeah I know. <laughs> Then we kind of carried on walking. Said okay come we'll go back. <laughs> And we went back. But I think what I realized yesterday 
was that here was my father. I was the rebellious one, right? I was the one acting up. Yeah. But here was my father who came to me, stepping out completely of his comfort zone, right? Just willing to do what it took to just reassure me that I was loved and that he loved me. And it was just that sense of the father coming, reaching out, you know, to me. And I think I, when I look back, I realize that no matter what I did in my life, and there are lots of things I did and messed up in many ways, the one place I always knew I could go back to was home, to my mom and dad, uh, because I was always sure of their love. And I, I was thinking of, as I wrote that down, I thought about the verse that uh, in Matthew, that, uh, that Jesus says, which of you, if your own son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, and he's talking about fathers, will give him a snake? If you then, to the fathers, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Um, and so I was just thinking about that and then thinking about the second son. That here's the boy who was with his father, had access to everything that his father had, including that love, that extravagant love, the prodigious love. And yet he's so bitter. You know? And we see that bitterness in, how in, in, in what he says. You know, I did all this, I did this, 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 this for you, but you never gave me even a goat to celebrate with my friends. Right? So there's all that grudge. He's been doing it grudgingly. He's been do, doing it with a sense of duty, right? And the father is just looking at him saying, but everything I had was yours, right? So imagine if this, fa if this boy had lived from the, from the knowledge of his father's love and delight, if that had defined him, perhaps this brother might have been at the front with the father welcoming his younger brother home. He can't even be happy that his younger brother who is lost has now come back. Yeah. And I was just thinking that in a sense for this, this uh, uh, the, the, the second son, just that sense of bitterness that held him back, that stopped him. And how many times is that true maybe for us? Yeah, in, in, in our circumstances, that we're looking at something that we're so focused on what we don't have or so focused on what's not coming our way, yeah, that we miss out on this extravagant love that the Father has. And when we live from that place, that knowledge of His love in us, how might that change the way we see ourselves and do the things we do? Yeah. So you see, the story is really about the prodigal father. And a disobedient son and a dutiful son. And both who made the same mistake in letting their reality define them and therefore miss this amazing love. In fact, that song, the, there's a line in the song that says, um, uh, what is it? Your real, uh, somewhere I have it here. Yeah, you are my reality. The song says to the father, you are my reality. Yeah. So whether we like the wayward son or the dutiful one, when we let anything other than his thoughts define us, we miss this greatest reward. Yeah. So if he is our reality, just to be mindful that we are not defined, our reality is not defined by, our identity is not defined by our failures, by our successes, by our sin, by our repentance, or our duty. Yeah? None of that defines us except the outpouring of the Father's love poured out unconditionally into each one of our hearts. In fact, the psalmist says, keep me as the apple of, my, of your eye. And just for us today to just recognize that each and every one of us are the apple of his eye. That messed up son in the pigsty was the apple of his eye. <coughs> That dutiful son doing things grudgingly was the apple of his eye. And when you look at, go back to that thing, your thoughts define us. In Psalm 139, the psalmist says, How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. 
Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grain of sand. That's the depth and breadth of his thoughts about each one of us. So today if we take just even one thing away uh, from the story of the prodigal father, yeah, uh, let's just take this, that the arms of the father are around us. He is not going to let go no matter what. Let his thoughts about us, beloved, precious, work of art, my daughter, my son, in whom I am so pleased, let those words define us. Let, us, let them be how we see ourselves, let them be how we experience life, let them bring us joy, let them give us assurance, let them define who we are and what we do. So what I'd really like us to do now, just and even those of you on Facebook, um, you can do it maybe on your phones, on a piece of paper, there's some post-its. I just want you to write down maybe two or three things, ways in which you have defined yourself or you've been defined, things that have been said, yeah, worthless, you, I don't know, what you've said to yourself. I want you to put those three things down, right? And then I'll tell you what to do next. So maybe just specifically write down three things for now and maybe you can go back home and do this even more. Maybe you'll have a longer list of things to write down about how you see yourself, how you have let yourself, how you have defined yourself, the words you have spoken to yourself, maybe the words that have been spoken about you which you've taken into your heart. Yeah. And then what I'd like you to do is I'd just like you to just, just be with you, just be quiet for a little while and just wait on God, okay? And let Him show you, maybe in a picture or a verse or a word, how He sees you. And I want you to actively scratch out what you have written and write down what God is speaking to you in this moment of how He sees you. to the word of prayer but before that I just want to encourage us that this is not something we do just today but this is something that we do every single day until we it just becomes habit for us to define ourselves and see ourselves as the father sees us and on this father's day Lord we just want to thank you that you are our Father, your thoughts define us, Lord. You are our reality. You come running with a ring and a rope. And really that grace is a collision on our way back home to your arms, Lord, to the Father who never lets us go. We just say, come Holy Spirit, this morning, pour out the Father's love afresh into each and every one of our hearts, Lord. May our lives and our homes be filled with your love. May it shape and define us. I thank you for every way in which you have spoken to us this morning, very specifically, Lord, for all that we have cancelled and all that we have received. I rebuke every lie that has defined us in the mighty name of Jesus. I cancel every lie, cast them out, and just release a fresh outpouring of the Father's love into each of our hearts, into this body. We thank you, Father, for your prodigious love for us. We receive it this morning, and we let it go deep and sink deep into our hearts. In your precious and beautiful name, Jesus, we thank you and we pray. Amen.
just want to read something that Meher has written on Facebook. Sandhya wrote from Psalm 33 verse 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his steadfast love. And this is what Meher wrote. How do I define myself? I know I do not see myself with my heavenly father's eyes. I define myself according to the deeds of my child. If she does well, I feel good. If she is praised, I feel happy. If she does shameful things, I want to hide my face. When she does not conform, I feel disturbed. And so I think, how would the father define himself? If he were to measure his worth by the deeds of us, his children, there would be hardly any happiness in his high eyes. For we constantly turn from him, constantly fall into sin. But that is not the character of our Heavenly Father. He reaches for us even when his heart is heavy. As we struggle through the consequences of our sin, he stands aside as we willfully walk in wrong ways, but yet ready to enfold us in his embrace. When we turn back in helplessness, my father stands at the door of my heart. When I cry, he cries with me. When I'm sad, he takes me in his lap. When I grieve, he grieves with me. And he runs, yes, he runs, to hold me fast, to hold me still, to envelop me in his embrace. So I see myself, unworthy as I am, inadequate as I am, made worthy by God, Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> verse that Sandhya George shared, Psalm 33, verse 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those whose hope is in His steadfast love. realize that as we fear God, He takes fear away from us. Yes. Right? So that we don't have to fear anything else as we just look to Him in awe and reverence and He just takes away
are good in all your thoughts, in all your ways, are good to the Father. We just thank you that really we are your children, we are your people. And this is your church. And really God, I pray that through this week,
or July. Yeah. The second July or third July, that Sunday will be again all online on Zoom. Third July. We'll be all online on Zoom for all the cities. Big family journey together. So just for now, can give a nice big bang. Bye. 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 <laughs>